Welcome to Barn Blog. I am here with Matt Huber, author of Climate Change is Class War, Building Socialism on a Warning Planet, out from who one of the people you'd expect it to be out from, Verso. Um, and we're here to talk about a couple of things today, which is the, the intermingling of the labor movement and environmentalism, a topic I have covered as well with Josiah Richter. Um, but also maybe the the different approaches to that question because once you once you get to that question mm -hmm. that there is a relationship between labor the labor movement and the green movement um one that is kind of obscured i think by the kind of conservationist movement being seen mm -hmm. as representative of the environmental movement mm -hmm. um you then get into what are you going to do about it, which leads to a whole different series of debates. Mm -hmm. um, but let's start off before we get to the what you're going to do about it. Let's talk about what the relationship really is. How is climate change a classed phenomenon? Yeah, so the in, in many ways, the book was trying to respond to a, a more mainstream sort of analysis of climate change as a problem of inequality or, you know, Oxfam America, Thomas Piketty have done these anal analyses of what they call extreme carbon inequality. And, and, and essentially what they show is that, uh, you know, if you're richer and you have more money, you spend more money on consumption and you have a higher carbon footprint associated with that. So they do all these analyses, look, the rich emit way more than the poor. And, um, what I, what I noted is that all these analyses are just centering on consumption and lifestyle choices as the, the source of all emissions, right? And um, it, 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 it really struck me that this is not a particularly Marxist uh, analysis of class. It's basically based on people's income and consumption and lifestyle practices. And, that, um, and it actually just sort of erases the role of ownership and production in uh, provisioning all forms of lifestyle and consumption. So, um, I mean, there's a, a lot of other stuff going on. I mean, essentially, the, the whole idea of a carbon footprint was really invented by British Petroleum as part of their Beyond Petroleum campaign. Um, you know, they're, I think they're very happy to have this narrative that, like, all of us contribute through our consumption to the carbon emissions because it takes a lot of attention off them as the producers. But, um, you know, it's also just sort of from a basic level, like every moment of consumption when you're emitting carbon, like can link back to someone that's profiting off the sale of the, of that, uh, of that um, fuel, let's say. So you're driving your car, you're like, you're emitting, yes, but like the, the, the oil company sold you the fuel, they're making the money off of it. You're just trying to get to work, right? You're just sort of reproducing your life. Um, and, um, and the word, the biggest thing that, that drives me crazy is that I think the the the, the rich uh, consumption is like the least of our problems when it comes to climate change because we really should be paying attention to how the rich generate their money, not how they spend it, right? So if we look at how they make their money, we see they might be owners of 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 say like a chemical company, you know, that uh, emits millions of tons of carbon dioxide per year, and 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 they spend eight to twelve hours a day organizing that network of chemical factories and like. And that's just an enormous impact. And yet, when people talk about people's carbon footprint and carbon, they only pay attention to what that person does outside of their uh, of their role as a capitalist, right? So if they drive an SUV, that's what the problem is. Or if they eat steak, that's what the problem is. But the real problem is that they they accumulate capital and um, and want to expand carbon intensive production. So so in any event, like looking at it um, from that angle, focus. It's just like basic Marxist definition of class is your relationship to production and ownership and power over production. And, uh, you know, it just creates a totally different way of analyzing the climate problem, I think. So. Hmm. So what are some of the conclusions you come when you look at the way the actual production of class plays into this? I mean, one of the things, uh, Josiah Richter pointed out is how much environmental legislation came from labor protection legislation and was mm. explicitly advocated for in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. And then was kind of 
not entirely intentionally written out of the history books about the the way those legislations were passed. Um, not entirely being somewhat tongue in cheek. Uh, in what other ways do you see, like, you know, yes, we talk about cli- we. I hear climate justice in, in terms of inequality all mm-hmm. the time, um, mm-hmm. but. And yes, I will also admit, you know, I've had some uh, green advocates throw at me that like, well, even if you look at the fact that most of this is uh, uh, capitalist production that's doing most of the polluting, it's still ultimately for consumer goods. And I was like, okay, that, mm-hmm. I'm not sure what you're trying to like. Do, no, do, I mean... <laughs> That's a that's a popular argument, and it's 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 rooted in neoclassical economics, like consumer sovereignty, and it, it it it's a view of the economy that it's really consumers that have the power, and they drive demand, they drive production decisions. So there shouldn't be any people on the left or Marxists making that argument. <laughs> like we, you know, we should understand that 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 again, like the real power in the economy is those those that own productive resources and those that control production, and so. When you look at it this way again, um, you know, like we, we're told that like responsibility for climate change is so diffuse, it's sort of distributed through behaviors. And but but if you look at it in terms of who owns and controls uh, production, it's actually quite a small group of people. So it's um, it's a uh, it's a much more straightforward class of people you have to confront to deal with climate change. It's not easier to confront them, but it's at least a little more straightforward than kind of this quite moralistic project of like converting the lifestyles of millions of dispersed consumers. Um, it's just a different kind of class project you have to be involved in. So. so one of the things I think that, that, that you really point out that is downstream from these assumptions, but directly related I'm going to continue flashing your book up. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, is when, you know, you start off telling the story of Al Gore, uh, mm-hmm. but, but you don't tell it as in the normal, like Al Gore savior of our knowledge of climate change or Al Gore, dirty hypocrite who owns a super mansion and travels by jet. Mm-hmm. Both of whom were, both stories were pretty common in the last decade. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> You uh, you tell you tell it as a story of the failure of knowledge as a form of way to deal with a social issue. Yes. So I feel like we're dealing with this this week. You know, one of these IPCC reports just came out. So mm-hmm. it's this a sort of liberal view that like the climate crisis is fundamentally about knowledge and the science. And, and if we just get the science more accepted, then we're going to sort of naturally lead to more action on climate. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 there's this idea that like sooner or later, like if we can just con- convince the masses of the truth of believing the science, then, you know, we're going to solve climate change. And it it acts as if like the worst thing that the fossil fuel industry does is they fund climate science denial. Like that's, that's the, 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 the most sinful thing that they do as opposed to like a mass political power through, you know, you know, you look at like the Koch brothers, they like basically write laws for state legislatures and, and, and not to mention they, you know, extract fossil fuels and profit off it handsomely. So, um, it, you know, I, I argue in, in the book uh, that it's it's a very professional class or professional stratum, whatever you want to call it. It's a little uh, dicey, but uh, it's it's a it's a it's a politics of a class that's really grounded in um, credentials and educational attainment and ideas of meritocracy and being smart. And like when you're coming from that kind of position, like knowing the science and, and spreading the truth of climate change is a sort of like the most important thing you think needs to get across. But, um, you know, the yellow vest, uh, gilet jaune eruption in France, you know, they had this slogan, politicians care about the end of the world, but we're just trying to get to the end of the month. It's just 
very clear that this politics of do you believe the science isn't actually really reaching people and their more um, everyday concerns, material uh, interests that, that that they might actually respond to. Um, so, in many ways, a lot of a lot of these liberals kind of look at um, the masses as sort of misinformed and sort of idiots that don't quite understand the science, right? So it's a real problem, real political um, non-starter in a lot of ways, I think. That's, I remember a couple, uh, well, the last four years to me have all been one blurry long year in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> um, but I remember somewhere, I think about two years ago, in the build back better rounds of negotiations, I lost my shit with the progressive caucus. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I lost my shit with the progressive caucus is not that they were insisting on climate change legislation mm -hmm. being in that bill, but that the hill they thought it was the best to die on mm -hmm. was the carbon tax. It was, was the, it was yeah. something called the clean electricity performance standard. Right. Um, <laughs> Which was this really wonky like way to regulate the um, the electric utilities to decarbonize very quickly. And anyway, I mean, Joe Manchin said, you know, like that's out, <laughs> that's not going to be in there, and he he killed it. So um, they they uh, they they realized quickly they didn't have any hill to fight on because Manchin, you know, blew up the hill or whatever. Um, but as far as I know, I will give. Biden and the and 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 just the Democrats in Congress right now credit they actually concluded that carbon pricing and carbon taxes is not a good smart political way to go for um, climate change and so they've tried to reframe it as you know what they call it industrial policy as we're sort of like trying to create a lot of they call them carrots and incentives to to you know do the right thing for the climate and there's no kind of sense that you know solving climate change means sort of raising the price of energy through taxes or through cap and trade systems or through all these things um, yeah i noticed that in the difference between the the stuff argued for and the build back better where where the progressives threw a fit um but it, and what they did in the inflation reduction act uh, mm -hmm. where they, you know, uh, passed the most progressive climate legislation. Um, uh, <laughs> I have to, I just, I just, it, it bugs me because I put it in scare quotes, not because it isn't true. It actually is true. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was like, it's not even half of what you guys committed to in the Paris Accords. So, mm -hmm. I guess it's good that you actually put it in legislation, mm -hmm. but, but anyway, um, but I did notice it did not have the, the putative carbon taxing elements in it that we had seen and, and maybe that they had learned something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that said, uh, it also still, despite all the green developmentalist stuff in it, has a kind of poison pill of tying all that directly to traditional carbon industries like coal and gas. Um, and then you have the fact, and I, I don't think this is talked to uh, about enough in the, as a labor issue, but that a lot of the non-scientific specialist jobs in, cl in clean energy development are, to put it mildly, shitty jobs. Yeah, yeah. Um, sure. they 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 vastly tend to be more ununionized and traditional, mm -hmm. um, carbon extraction. Um, they, a lot of them are kind of gig worky. Yeah, um, they're absolutely. Um, and so I still have not seen that dealt with. Where, you know, even if we replace these jobs in traditional carbon extraction with quote green jobs these green jobs right now unless you are a scientist uh are not particularly good mm -hmm. and it's just sort of the nature of the jobs um if you've 
uh, ever heard of the labor reporter Lauren Gurley. She did an incredible analysis of solar jobs and how exploitative they are. They are gig work. They're provisioned by temp agencies. One's called People Ready. <laughs> it's, it's a literal company. And um, she shows the labor conditions for these solar workers. They're, they're building these solar farms in very sunny places, so they're exposed to extreme heat, you know? Mm -hmm. But also, like, she talks about some of them are in, you know, exotic places where there's like snakes and alligators that are like, these are workplace hazards for these solar workers. But um, essentially like, places, so what's that? I, I grew up in those places. So yeah. I feel you. So like, um, you know, the, the nature of these jobs is they are spread out um, in, in remote places and they are transient work. The, you know, if you're a kind of a fully automated uh, communist type person, it's pretty cool that when you build these uh, solar and wind uh, installations, they provide free energy without, you don't need much labor once they're built, right? Because they're just harnessing the free energy of the sun and wind. But that means that they don't create any kind of permanent jobs like a traditional power plant would. So uh, I was just looking into a, a solar farm in Texas that has like 1,800 construction jobs, which is a lot. And some of those jobs have been unionized through like the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. But that solar farm with 1,800 jobs leads to two permanent jobs, two. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, like... Some of these have more permanent jobs than others. I think offshore wind has a sort of more sort of long-term kind of industrial model to it. And the, the Inflation Reduction Act also has at least the, the hope that they're going to incentivize the actual domestic manufacturing of solar panels and wind turbines and all this kind of stuff, which is almost, you know, mostly produced in China and offshore right now. So if that happens, like, you know, manufacturing is a great avenue for workers and unions and all that kind of stuff so that might be good but like the the solar farms and the wind farms are just not like you said they're not good jobs they're not going to be organizable and not not particularly conducive to working class power that's for sure yeah that's that's a part of this i think is often not discussed in in, in real detail yeah um particularly we talk about the green new deal where i'm like if you got if you bring the development part of it in and we talk about making those good jobs i'm with you but i remember the obama recovery those were not good jobs and if you're promising that as the alternative yeah. you're going to turn what little sympathy you might have in the rust belt in the south and the and the sun belt um for you know replacing their broke ass coal mines um with something much better uh against you because you're you're not you're not offering them a better life at all and i think that really you know maybe you're offering them life at all i guess it, there's this weird kind of bait and switch on this when you when you bring this up we're like well, yeah but we're saving the planet and i'm like well mm -hmm. one i hate to inform you but climate change is going to be a global effort but two mm -hmm. um and more importantly, in a lot of ways, like you have, like you want a post-capitalist transition society for this. Fine, I'm, I'm, I'm not opposed to that, but you're not there yet, and you need to do stuff now. Mm -hmm. So, how are you going to do that in a way mm -hmm. that gets people's well-being tied into it beyond an yeah, abstract so. trade-off? Exactly. Yeah. Um, the yellow vest was a perfect example. I was glad you spoke about it in your book. Um, there's been other trade-offs. I mean, th there is the Belgian controversy. I know, th I know a lot of people in Belgium told me a lot of those people were like small farmers who were not poor, but I was like, yeah. yeah and I I'm with you on that to a certain degree. However, um, I will also say that being from the South, a lot of proletarian are invested in local small business in ways that are logical in the immediate sense because they're the ways these people make their living and they're downstream from them. Um, and if you're going to hurt that group of people are, are you know, hurt that industry, you're really going to have to make it viable that there's something else to replace it. 
immediately. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think there, I mean, if we really were to solve climate change, it, it would require a massive reindustrialization of the economy. It would require building new energy infrastructure, new transmission lines, new transit infrastructure, new public, like public, we could fold in public housing and that kind of project would be about building a new society in, in a way that would generate lots of jobs and lots of um, livelihoods for workers and, and create union opportunities. Um, uh, but we're, we're not there. We're not doing that. Right. And so um, if, if there's this sort of vague sense that, you know, we're just going to build a, a bunch of solar farms and wind farms, and that's going to take care of it. That's not going to be a, a conducive window. So like you were sort of hinting before, like the, the, the unions have often been at loggerheads with environmentalists because the client, and this includes the climate movement, the climate movement is most comfortable blocking shit. Like, <laughs> I don't know if I can say that, but like blocking stuff like blocking pipelines, like doing protests at coal mines to kind of block that. Just recently, Greta Thunberg is blocking a wind farm in, I think it was uh, Sweden, because there's an indigenous tribe up there that's really upset about the wind farm. So they're, block they're blocking wind farms. So that is like where the climate movement is. And, and in fact, Naomi Klein, her 2014 book called it Blockadia. This is sort of the front lines of climate resistance. We're gonna just block fossil fuels. But um, clearly, I think to actually solve climate change, we're going to have to build a lot of stuff. And that that politics, it's not that it wouldn't antagonize the unions. It would be like in their naked self-interest to embark on that kind of level of industrialization and manufacturing that would be required. But, um, uh, you know, I think there's a real tension there because a lot of uh, environmentalists, a lot of sort of uh, climate movement people sort of um, associate uh, industrialization with sort of harm and injustice inherently. But I think that's the sort of path that's actually going to create jobs, create real, like, like you said, like actually reinvigorate some of these communities that have been completely abandoned by capital and, and all this stuff. So it's a, it's a tough, tough nut to crack for sure. Well, it, it reminds me of debates over like, NIMBY versus Jimbyism, uh, yeah, yeah. two concepts that I wish I could just get rid of from <laughs> all of history. And and the reason that I bring that up is like I've I've told people, for example, urbanization is great for efficiency, but you do have to admit it actually is based on like pouring resources in from other areas. Oh sure. If those other areas got payoff from that urbanization, it would be a lot less resented. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm, I'm going to go back to like classical early Marxism about trying to abolish the division between town and country, which is not exactly urbanizing everywhere either. It's more like, well, we are going to bring these benefits mm -hmm. and efficiency and mm -hmm. and all this to the countryside. And maybe more people will be able to live out there and have the benefits of the natural world if we can do it in a way that replicates the kinds of efficiencies we get. Um, which admittedly is a little hard to do because you're dealing you're dealing with centralization versus highly decentralized mm -hmm. uh, um, energy grids and whatnot. But I think it's something that socialists really have to think about. And then I'm like, that requires us to rethink development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like uh, one of my stances in the growth degrowth debates, and we're going to get to that because I know you've been invested in that lately, um, is that. I think from a standpoint of, of, of production, at least in the short run, fixing a lot of the problems are going to require a lot of, quote, growth, whatever the fuck we mean by that. Exactly. However, yeah. it's confusing when I talk to people about that because I'm like, you guys think of growth solely in the expansion of GDP, which mm -hmm. is an expansion of exploitation in some ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that we're talking about that. Mm -hmm. Like... We're mm -hmm. talking about the you know outputs and hopefully remaking inefficient outputs with efficient ones. And if you have non-capitalist incentives, you can make them in ways that they will last versus when you have capitalist incentives, when there's literally no incentive to make them last a very long exactly. time. Yeah, like, that's great. Socialism should be about rational 
planning and efficient use of resources. So I'm okay with, with all that, you know, like. Right. Well, that, that was my point when I saw, you know, those fights, I'm like, what, when Matt's saying he believes in growth, he's not saying he believes that we should expand GDP forever. <laughs> like he's saying that we're going to have to redo industrial output. And like, just on some basic levels, I used to live in Atlanta. Right. Um, a city that is in perpetual drought. Why is it in perpetual drought? It's not because it actually doesn't have plenty of rain. Right. It's because it's its entire water infrastructure is built in like 1910, and it's a city that's expanded to like I don't know 25 times what it was what that capacity was built for. Yeah. But currently, pulling all that infrastructure up under there's no capitalist incentive even for the state to do it. Mm -hmm. Like it's too expensive compared to mm -hmm. the. Mm -hmm the pay the payoff until it starts to just i don't know collapse which is occasionally happening mm -hmm. um so then i go we would it would be a massive infrastructure project mm -hmm. to go in and put efficient green piping and water infrastructure in atlanta now you start thinking about that in terms of transportation infrastructure in terms of which, oh my God, I mean, there are going to be some places where you're never going to get rid of personal cars. Sorry, I hate to explain how that, like running mass community trains to low to low population areas is not particularly efficient yet. But yeah, yeah. Uh, so we will probably need something like a few electric cars. But a lot of this is like I would personally, having lived in other countries that were smaller but had really good mm -hmm. uh, public transit system. Love to not own a car. Me too. I would yeah. love to just give that shit up. It's expensive. It's time consuming. Yeah. Uh, I have, you know, I, I, one of the happiest I was ever been is when I lived in South Korea and literally you could get anywhere by bus or train, you know, even in the middle of, the, of, of nowhere, you know, the, maybe you'd have to take some, some rickety natural gas taxi, but like for, for, 10 or 15 miles at most but in general you can get everywhere you need to go by foot train and bus and living like that was awesome there's yeah. no place in america where you can easily live like that except yeah. maybe dc and new york yeah yeah you know yeah if, for whatever reason often my position gets represented as wanting to just keep american <laughs> privatized consumption patterns the same um but any socialist would want to like rationalize the the consumption of energy and collectivize it you know like the 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 way the reason it's so uh good to live in that like south korea is like um it's just rat it's just sort of makes sense to, to 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 use resources for transportation in this sort of more collective way um you know uh obviously you're gonna get a lot of people who are like uh, antisocial and would prefer to like be alone in cars all the time. But I think most people would would understand that this is just a much more rational collective use of resources to invest in public transit and collective uh, infrastructure and in cities and housing and things like this. As I um, like to tell people headphones and a book will, can achieve a whole lot of isolation if you want it to. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to be social. Um, <laughs> although, uh, uh, as a, as a side note, as a person who was a mild, was, was a mild antisocial bent for a whole lot of younger people it would probably be helpful for them to be social. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I mean that in general, I, I, I have seen uh, plenty of evidence that, there's a variety of forms of social isolation that this sort of infrastructure, uh, which breeds alienation when combined with work structure that breeds alienation mm -hmm. uh, takes, takes a toll on people. And, and particularly when it's the working class. And I've been really big on like really pushing, like we should talk more about how the U S is, uh, you know, for people making under two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and seeing a decline in life expectancy, that's something we should really be talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, and and I also think if we took if we took this a green approach to this development, 
it would help with all of that. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when we're tied up in like, should we try to live on agrarian communes? Mm -hmm. Um with i don't know i, I want to talk to you actually i'm gonna pivot you wrote a critique that was also picked up by doug henwood um oh, yeah. of half or of half earth socialism mm -hmm. um which is one of the uh i actually bought the book on uh, uh off of your critique to see if to see if it is what it is i haven't finished it yet so i can't <laughs> speak to that but but um one of the things I've noticed about some of the degrowth socialism, and I'm going to put a caveat on anything I say here for people at me, I'm not necessarily against all the ideas in degrowth socialism, but some of them reminded me almost of, of like a Howard Kunstler, like let's go back to the 18th century or like, Oh God. Yeah. I'm an oil, I'm an oil scholar. So I, James Howard Kunstler, right. The, the peak right. oil guy, right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you remember <laughs> the long emergency. So right. Yeah. So I, I was deep in the peak oil. I, I was learning about it and then I, I learned to reject it. But uh, I was sort of really reading a lot of him and uh, like Richard Heinberg and these type of people um, in the, the aughts. That was sort of where I was in the aughts. So I talk a lot about my political journey, probably too much. <laughs> uh, but when I came out of being a uh, conservative, I went through this period of like Marxism and Floyd Wigner ideas. But I went through also in that time period, I think we have to take our brains back to the end of the aughts, where like it was like yep. this weird war between primitivist and transhumanist with like mm. and, and like people who were into peak oil. And mm. I remember when I grasped peak oil, I was like, huh. Even if it's true, I don't think it means what it thinks. What you think it means, I think it means that like we have more expensive oil mm -hmm. and weirder technologies to extract it. I don't think it means that like society goes back to the 19th century in like two decades yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um. So, but there is a whiff of that. It's not quite the same, and I I, I want to be careful. I'm like over generalizing here. And what I've seen from some of these degrowth advocates who seem to really think it would be possible to take a planet of the size that we live on and convert it to a mostly agrarian style uh, society and do so without a lot of use of modern agricultural technology, which is the part where I'm like, I don't know how you do that. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, I've, I have read the odd article that says, yes, we can organic farm with some efficiency methods in specific areas, almost as efficient as throwing nitrogen fertilizer on things. But, but in most areas you can't. Yeah. And, and I, mean, I just, yeah. <laughs> Sri, Sri Lanka just did an experiment with this. They tried to ban chemical fertilizer and, um, it did not go well. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I mean, to be fair, I think um, that first of all, the half earth socialist book never says, if, I, if I'm correct, never says the word degrowth and they don't claim to be degrowthers, but they're of a certain uh, genre that, that has some overlaps, I would say. And, and when it comes to the degrowthers, they're always very slippery. They, they definitely don't claim to advocate some sort of full-on uh, return to agrarian... Uh, um, no, they don't. Uh, you know, socialism or whatever. And But they, uh, all of them, I think, seem to agree that in a future eco-socialist uh, society that more people should work in agriculture. So... Um, that I think is something they, they, they all agree on and, and, um, and they, they do very, I think, I think it's fair to say they agree that we should renounce a lot of the, um, gains that have come through industrial agriculture, particularly nitrogen fertilizer, which to me is, um, I just read something the other day that, that claim that half of humanity now is, is reliant on this 
really wild thing we did in the 20th century. You know, apart from fossil fuel revolution, the nitrogen revolution is probably in terms of raising our 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 uh, food product productivity. Like it's just unprecedented what we were able to do. So, um, so Can yeah, I think about there, there are concerns about that. I do have concerns about night about using about overusing nitrogen fertilizer because of things like algae blooms in the ocean. Sure. And yeah. Like that. But there are problems with it for sure. Um, but my response is always like, well, why don't we just try to develop a better nitrogen fertilizer or, or some replacement for nitrogen fertilizer or some, some way of like, actually what the likelihood response is like learning where and when to deploy exactly. this in a more efficient manner where yeah. we, don't use as much i don't know near oceans or something like i realize i realize yeah, like, the water cycle is not that simple but yeah yeah <laughs> no it really it, it really is uh you know you can develop seeds and different plants that can take it up more efficiently you can do all these things to um again it's like plant you need more planning you need more rational ecological planning to use it in a more efficient way because right now it makes sense for the producers of nitrogen to just sell as much of it as possible and then and oftentimes the farmers are trying to hedge for bad seasons so they just dump it on their crops for with the hopes that if it's a good rainy season they're going to get a, a a boom crop and so it's the, the capitalist system sort of is hardwired for it to be wasted and to be uh pollution oriented but i think with a rational socialist planning approach you could definitely use it in way more efficient ways so um but the the key is that um, when it comes to natural sources of nitrogen, I mean, we don't have a lot of options to replicate what this kind of synthetic nitrogen is able to do. So manure and cover cropping and, um, you know, we exhausted the guano uh, uh, islands off of Peru and in the, in the Chilean um, nitrate fields in the 19th century. So it, I think we we um, are going to have to use nitrogen. We just use it more efficiently, just like everything else that a socialist approach would would take, I think. I've also pointed out to people that if you're using natural bases of nitrogen at that scale, you're probably also doing the same thing to the ocean. So like, you would still need to figure out ways to engineer this in a way that it is uh, more efficient, more we that we recap recapture some of it would be great i mean there and there's no incentive to do that in a in a capitalist uh you know economy outside of a very exactly. small scale you know yeah, boutique yeah. petty bourgeois like <laughs> project um right. which which they occasionally i mean I, I do point out that like yes yeah, sometimes petty bourgeois have like moral reasons that they can run businesses that are inefficient but like um that's never scalable. That's the problem. And and it's not scalable as a means for people to go buy from it either, because um, if you try to upscale that usually in this current system, what you end up doing is like you actually collapse the business because it can't meet demand. Mm -hmm. And yeah, exactly. So it's, it, you know, and it gets bought by these big corporations who don't do whatever you were looking at in the beginning. So even that sort of like valiant, small entrepreneurial uh, thing uh, is kind of strategically doomed. Now, I don't think, I know that the great, the degrowth socials are not, or are not arguing this, but I've just, I'm like, when you, when you think about the technologies we would do, that's where we tend to see them right now. But a lot of them either don't scale or if they could scale, there's no incentive to scale them. So like, mm -hmm. That's something we really have to think about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I I tend to I tend to be I don't know I, I find that while I'm not one of these bright green socialists and we have some mutual friends who are I am sort of like we have to rethink development just entirely mm -hmm. and we're probably going to have to rethink over a over a long time all kinds of things like like i talked about like like getting country life and city life more copacetic with each other um which is, would also be in any kind of democratic society politically stabilizing um getting these incentives more lined up 
And since I don't see you like overthrowing a government to do that tomorrow, mm-hmm. um, and I guess the other kind of degrowth socialist is there's a kind of communizer who mm-hmm. really does believe that like we to fix the climate crisis we really have to let the climate crisis like uh, do a whole lot of damage to. Mm-hmm to get people to realize their collective need. It's not an accelerationist argument, but it's close. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I don't think these people would call themselves degrowthers and I don't want to like slander the degrowthers by associating with them, but it it is an argument I encounter more regularly than I thought. Mm -hmm. Um, What do you think of the problems with that approach with like, well, we have to like, just, you know, I almost think of it uh, in more conventional politics it's the kind of doomer approach, like right. climate change will fix itself because it's going to do a lot of damage. And that's going to like basically force us to innovate slash also kill a ton of people. And then we will be in a scenario. And I'm always like, seems like we could avoid letting a bunch of people die. Just, you know, like, yeah, seems yeah. To me we could do that. Like <laughs> you can, you can Google this. Uh, you may have already seen it, but there's, I think a a pamphlet or a book or an article that's basically just called disaster communism. And it, and it takes up this, this idea that like basically in disasters is when, you know, we develop these, I I think Rebecca Solnit wrote a similar type of book, like about how in these crises, people come together and they rebuild community and solidarity and it's all beautiful and all this stuff. Um, And you know, like we were talking about before, like there is a lot of isolation and atomization in our society. So yeah, it probably is good for people to like sort of figure out collectively how to provision life in a disaster. So, but um, I'm just very much invested in the the Marxist uh, idea that like actually we're living in this ridiculous period of of abundance and productive capacity that gives us the opportunity to really create a, a abundant um, uh, and, you know, like uh, just a, a, not even abundant, just a comfortable life for every human on the planet and, 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 and abolish poverty and give everyone, uh, you know, each according to their needs, right? Like this is, this is, a, you know, Ingalls talked about, like, this is a world historical uh, possibility for the first time in history that we have this productive capacity to, to deliver um, the abolition of class and hierarchy in society. So y- you can't have that Marxist position without thinking that this, this communism or this socialism has to grow out of these industrial, highly productive systems that exist. Like it's, it's going to, th- it's those systems that create the material conditions that can, can actually create freedom and abundance for, for the masses. Now, a lot of people would say that because of the ecological crisis, that's now off the table. But I still want to hold to that because we we still live in this uh, period of, I think, ridiculous uh, overproduction of all sorts of useless crap that no one needs. And like we still have the capacity to just build a world that works for everyone easily. Right. We have the productive capacity. So. Like if you if you're gonna just say yeah I don't like that very much I wanna I wanna pin my hopes on disaster communism like you said you're you're saying that like yeah well, you know hundred million will die or whatever a lot of death but we'll like build up this beautiful communism and in, in the ruins right in the in the ruination of like that sounds awful like I don't want that I don't think anyone wants that so anyway yeah, yeah I'm de- I'm definitely with you on that like it just <laughs> seems it it seems like hey look. We're producing cheap disposable crap with our resources that we could be producing not cheap permanent not crap. Yes. Um, and we could do it for I don't know, literally every fucking body where nobody would yes. have to die. And you know, I'm not a believer in overpopulation, but I actually do think population stabilization would be great. Um, the UN says it's going to happen already. So right, I, I, my point has always been it's going to happen naturally. It could yeah, look yeah. a lot less ugly if we, if we, you know, uh, had rational policies about this. Had rational policies about moving from places that are affected. For like, it it just seems 
it just seems kind of obvious to me <laughs> that that we have the capacity to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no political will for it. It's it, a lot of its capital. It's also um, uh, the way capitalist states compete with each other um, because you know that leads to a lot of irrational population apart. You know, appointment people just can't move to where there would be more places for them to, you know, you know. But even in a place like the United States, if we had stuff built up in a more sensical way, mm-hmm. um, like the interior of the country would probably be a lot more developed and also a lot more attractive. Um, yeah. uh, and so these are the kinds of issues that I, I, I think a lot about. Now, yes, I realize there's some places I don't know parts of South Dakota that just naturally you're going to have to be a certain kind of person to want to live there but Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) uh, uh, because it's, you know, kind of extremophile weather just inherently. Right. But in general, um, I think we could apportion this a lot better. I even thought about like the, the, you know, the quote water crisis. The water crisis is an interesting one for me because that's one mostly of pollution because I'm always like, you know, you realize that like the water table is renewable. It's a cycle. You don't lose much water in that cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason why it gets lost is because it gets contaminated. Like, but that's avoidable. Like, in, in contamination with like natural contaminants, such as like uh, human biological waste, that's processable. Even. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't, you, you you know, I mean, there's other things where I've always, where, where I have been like, why do we use, anyway, like, why do we use so much water to get rid of stuff that's full of nitrogen anyway, where we could like figure out a way to safely compost that. But that's a whole nother thing. People get grossed out by that. But, but <laughs> that spirit, I remember, you know, you read like, A cybernetic socialist or even like weirdo socialist adjacent people like uh, oh, Buckminster Fuller. Mm -hmm. And they were thinking about these problems in a pretty interesting Mm -hmm. way that would be incentivized in a non-profit driven society. Mm -hmm. They are not degrowth unless degrowth means something different and that that's my issue with with degrowth i think it's similar to yours it's not necessarily that even disagree with a lot of what they're proposing or a lot of their arguments it's that i don't know exactly what they're proposing except sometimes sometimes they 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 seem to be proposing like letting the develop like stopping development in the developed world so the underdeveloped world can catch up yeah which i'm just like we should be developing the underdeveloped world. I, you know, we, you know, with them being you know, the people living there being in charge of how that's deployed to some degree. I think people make rational decisions when they have the ability to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, not against any of that. Yeah, not a yeah. big like, I'm not a big like socialist in one nation forever thing. So that's not yeah. my, that's not my gig. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I don't see why you need to stop development um, <laughs> of these, unless you really think that we cannot develop responses to finite resources. Right. That's and, yeah. Yeah. That's, and I don't want libertarians to win that debate against us anymore. That's <laughs> like because so far. They're, you, they 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 deploy that against socialists and other kinds of leftists because we we are always like we are often too pessimistic. I mean, how many socialists got into that population bomb thing in the '60s? It's kind of crazy. Though. Yeah, it's uh it's tough, and we don't have to talk about this too much. But um, for whatever reason, I remember watching some AOC event where she just talked about um you know, like the lack of housing or something in New York city. And she said, people are just subscribing to a scarcity mindset. Right. And I feel like so much of what we've been dealing with since the 1970s, is just basically that it's like a scarcity mindset. It's like, we can't afford to do anything. We can't afford to um, give people health care. We can't afford 
to, uh, uh, you know, and, and from the degrowth perspective, like, sorry, the global north is grown enough and they need to degrow now. Like, just sorry, the jigs up, the ecological crisis is here. We need to degrow. I mean, meanwhile, there's like hookworm has returned to parts of the U.S. South because of like literally like just decrepit sanitation infrastructure that does not exist anymore. And, you know, you have incredible poverty in the global north and incredible need for development uh, and growth to solve a lot of the issues of climate change and all this stuff. So why can't we grow the global south and the global north? That One of the, the issues is they they create a it's like almost like a territorial class struggle between, you know, it's the global north that's exploiting the global south. So we're going to degrow the global north and and grow the global south. But but of course, as we know, uh, the global north has lots of capitalists and lots of uh, like exploited workers and the global south uh, has way more in poverty and exploited workers, but also has some capitalists and, and stuff like this. So it reminds me of 80s style 80s and 90s style malice third worldism but rebranded as an ecological uh there are these overlaps claims. that is absolutely true um which is interesting to me because you know i have i have always been like yes the in some broad scale uh, from a world systems perspective the periphery yeah. devours the core but i, I want to remind you that even in wallerstein the periphery is not a nation and it's most definitely not yeah. a region. It's specific yeah. places mm -hmm. and specific classes within those places. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. peripheries geographically, both between nations, but also within them. And mm -hmm. we see this in the South, the Rust Belt, the industrial Midwest. Yeah. You know? And, and look, I don't think I was reading today about some botched, uh, liver transplant policy where like new york and california were really benefiting and but like everywhere else in the country was really not and things had gotten worse and i'm like that's the worst kind of thing that we need is to make it look like that like we can only fix urban problems by basically parasiting off of every place else um so there, like in that sense there needs to be equalization that also needs to happen between nations but that does not mean you can't develop particularly if we're talking about development that requires the development <laughs> of new, of new re resources technologies and infrastructure and use of technologies that we that we currently have yeah i mean you know yes there there you know i say this looking at a, a pair of headphones that are wireless and like i would it would be nice if we weren't wasting lithium on making everything wireless it probably doesn't need to be um mm -hmm you know that would be great uh you know like um, it would be nice if we could decide things collectively like that like do we do we do we need those uh uh wireless headphones or 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 do we want to devote social resources to other more important ends like that that um and i think the degrowthers agree with that they they want to like they when you push them they it, it's very clear they want to grow a lot of things right they, they they want to grow some good things like public transit and healthcare and education and stuff and uh they want to degrow the bad sort of like you know useless consumer stuff that we've been talking about so um, so do we exactly That's so like... so there's no reason to call it degrowth there's no reason to make these aggregate claims about the global north must degrow um uh but that it, it, I hate to say it, but it's it's become almost a branding thing where they have to cling to the to the to the to the term degrowth. Which the 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 other book in that new left review piece I review is called "The Future Is Degrowth," and they actually, to give them credit, they they review all the people that say you really shouldn't be calling this degrowth, and they're like, yeah, so we get this, but we're still going to call it degrowth. <laughs> so they. They review it, but they they double down. They say we st we think it's um they they think it's like some counter hegemonic thing because they see the hege the hegemony today is like growth, right? There's this growthism, mm. and we all just fetishize GDP growth, and we just think if growth is up, like society's doing well, and um and uh, I mean, in some ways they're right. 
No, they're absolutely but, right. But, they but, but it's that, more than just hegemonic. Capitalism doesn't work if bro is not up. Like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and but and but they it's almost Gramsci sometimes argued that like you can get a counter hegemony that's like by negating the the existing ideology, you're almost reinforcing the power structure that it represents. And I think there's something like that going on where um you know, like growth is like an ideological mystification of of class society, where it sort of has it's this statistical construction that kind of says like, well, if this thing's going up, then everyone's doing well, right? But it's not true, right? It's like you can have GDP growth where it's it's a lot of profits for capital, and and the working class is getting really uh, not not doing so well. So, um, you know, this ideological mystification of growth then becomes a whole platform for another sort of counter movement that negates that mystification. And so they're on the terrain of mystification. That that's one of the arguments I try to make. So, yeah. So, you know, to, to kind of wrap this up, but I think this is a great point. This is actually my, my whole thing is like, I've argued with both Lee Phillips and Andy Grofers about this. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like, can we just quit talking about it in these terms? Right. Because it's yeah. not helpful. It, yeah. it, I, I've often told, I've said this to anti-imperialists too, and it pissed them off as well. Like, <laughs> like just flipping a, a dishonest narrative, mm -hmm. even if elements of that dishonest narrative are true. Right, right. It, you know, like, you know, the U.S. wants to be dominant. The U.S. is dominant. We need to fight that flip it okay um where i'm like yeah but you by flipping it you're actually still letting it a set your agenda in a lot of ways exactly yeah, yeah and and b you're not addressing the fact that like there's a mixed character to that whole thing and flipping the mixed character means that you also have j imported and inverted other things in it that may have been true or untrue yes and gotten stuck with that mm -hmm. um you know like, like with you, when I hear like we need like a larger inclusion in agriculture, you know, people working in agriculture, and I'm like, we need a more fair, equitable development of agriculture that involves like urban agriculture and all that stuff. But, and in that sense, I may agree with you, but I still think it's going to be like three to five percent of the population engaged in that because we have dealt with most of the technological problems of agriculture. We no longer need. 80% of the population mm -hmm. to be engaged in it. And I would love to not be wasting uh, fossil fuels on bullshit so that we could use it for stuff like medicine and growing food. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. you know, that's where you, you know, that's where you guys have me. But when you're just like, when, it, when there's this ambiguity where you're like, okay, do you mean just growing some things and not others? Do you mean mm -hmm. being, like when you talk about degrowing the north and growing the south, I'm like, if you mean fair development, if we're not in na na nation state competition for resources, I kind of think people are inclined towards that. If like the reasons why we aren't inclined towards fair development is usually because we're, we are put in an artificial situation where we have to compete for resources, in natural areas that we wouldn't normally have to compete. And that's even true within the United States, like mm -hmm. states competing for water rights in irrational ways that if we didn't have yeah. arbitrary ass state lines, we wouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it's, those are the kinds of problems that I think we really could, like we just need to answer it like with a, with a third thing, but like, okay, this is what we mean by green socialism. Go. Right. Like, um, which I also yeah. think would look different from most of the green parties in the world, frankly. Yeah. So, but yeah. Um, so thank you for coming on the show. I really enjoyed it. I'm a picture book one more time. Um, you don't have any other books, right? I do have another one I wrote um, right. uh, in 2013. It's about oil and uh, American uh, suburbanization and, that being the kind of framework that powered the the rise of the right and neoliberalism in the U.S. So. Oh, well, that's people should check that out. We uh, would you be interested in coming back on and talking about why suburbs are evil? 
Well, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't know that I think suburbs are evil. Yeah. But... Well, if you want to abolish town and country, uh, it kind of looks probably kind of like sort of suburbs everywhere. I don't know what it looks like, to be honest. But My best example of what town and country, the abolishing town and country looks like actually is an accident of the Korean geography. <laughs> and um, I was... I, you would go because there's so little arable land in Korea and the arable land is so important. Mm. There's this movement to build like high rises with walkable, like grocery stores and all this in rural areas. Mm. So That's there's cool. not, and there's not a lot of places on earth that are like that, but I'm like, That's cool. Yeah. That makes sense. You have, you yeah. have a lot of the advantages of centralization. You have a walkable place. People are not yeah. having to like, drive stupid pickup trucks all over the place um um and and yet the, there's a lot more green land than a, in a country without a lot of land like there's just mm -hmm. like particularly because of the stuff with the north the, and the, half the country's mountains you don't have a lot and i was like this is an example of even a crappy capitalist society mm -hmm. that has figured out something mm -hmm. that we could actually import into ours um and it's a lot less alienating than people think because while you don't have like your own little yard you have a lot of access to like public parks and everyone can use them and like there's you know there people don't get all uppity about people growing food in public parks so you can do a whole lot of stuff with that um and i make it sound like uh south korea is this post is post a capitalist utopia it absolutely is it's kind of awful in a lot of ways but Seems that yeah. that thing was like and i'm like we have some of this technology now we're exactly. not looking at it yeah. like um and i i don't you know i i'm one of these people who like the reason why the suburbs are because we never really built any other infrastructure for them but roads mm. like <laughs> like and built a lot of roads we were good we at that yeah. shit ton of roads <laughs> but yeah. Um and threw a lot of cars at them, but like if they were set up differently, um, they wouldn't be so bad. I don't think. I mean, it's not. Um. Uh, and they were also kind of designed in an alienating manner, but, yeah. Yeah. but I don't think like I'm also not a person who's like we need huge tracts of like prairie just to be there i mean I, I do think we do have to like protect i'm not opposed to protecting wildlife and stuff like that people don't but don't at me but uh <laughs> i do think that these are things that we could do that also because otherwise you're going to have a permanent like political divide that's kind of a reflective of a quasi-class divide between town and country and i don't mm -hmm. without dealing with those infrastructure issues i don't know how you how you fix that and that's plagued socialism and capitalist societies for literally 400 years like yeah it's, it's a tough it's, one <laughs> it's a, it's like a big fucking problem yeah so that's, that's true um and it's a problem that we used to be like well it's the peasants where i'm like we don't have peasants anymore and we still have this problem so like right. we have to think about this in well. a big way and that does require building a lot of shit it really does there's going to be no way not to and it it's also got to be a long project right like it can't be something you do um overnight but it, to fight climate change you do have to start thinking about ways that we could do it fairly fast but also very durably mm -hmm. and that's an important thing because yeah. i'm like you think that like what what's currently happening is our capitalist overlords think that they're just to be able to hang out on their you know whatever while things get real bad and mm -hmm. and wait it out Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sort of like, well, you want that not to happen. You have to make them think they're going to go down with us. So, yeah. uh, and I don't know much about the way we're talking about degrowth that really um, would scare them. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I don't think they're scared by degrowth at all. Um, but I agree with you. We need like a worker peasant alliance for the 21st century. It's some, right. some sort of version of that. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Matt, for coming on. Um, Thanks for having me. It's great. I, I enjoyed talking to you, even if I talked a lot for an interview. Um, no, no. It's great talking with you. All right. Have a good night. All right. Take care. Take care.